we start the new NIR year with a presentation about technology used in wildlife conservation. For obvious reasons, it's not always widely published what and how technology is used to save endangered species, for instance. But it is fascinating to understand what is used by people with a passion to conserve our wildlife. There are many different technologies from high-tech, high-priced items like satellites and seismic sensors to simple innovations like the integrated use of phones and radios that have all contributed to understanding efficiency and effectiveness within conservation efforts. In today's presentation, Dr. Cleo Graff will give us an overview to some of the most pressing conservation challenges and how technologies are being used, their impacts, and some of the challenges encountered in using them. Dr. Graff's current position is the Manager Research and Development Department at the Southern African Wildlife College in Hootspray. As a child in England, she dreamed of warm places with wild areas. After finishing her honours and master's degree in the UK, she took part in a conservation program in East Africa in 1999, and she has never looked back. As an ecologist, she has lived and worked all over South Africa in some amazing conservation areas. Despite these awesome experiences, she has also witnessed firsthand the many problems facing conservation within Africa. After finishing a doctorate of philosophy in ecology and conservation from the University of Groningen, in the Netherlands, I hope I pronounced that correct. She went looking for work that felt like fun, is meaningful, and which allowed her to live more or less in the bush. That is when she found the Southern African Wildlife College in Hootspray. In Dr. Graf's own words, I really like puzzles and problem solving, so I love my job coordinating research for the college's applied learning unit. As the manager of research and development department, I have the opportunity to think about and address loads of interesting and real world problems being faced by people, plants, wildlife, livestock, and landscapes in and around conservation areas across South Africa. I get to work with vastly different data sets and databases, conservation managers, communities, and researchers from all over the world as we tackle some of the problems currently being faced in natural resource management. And the best bit, via our curriculums at the SAWC is that we can feed what we learn straight back to the students who are and will be the conservation managers of the future. Cleo told you, Han, that she likes interactive presentations, so feel welcome to ask questions at any time. Just wave your hand to get attention. I remember if you're muted to unmute yourself when we give you an opportunity to ask the question. And remember that you can also post questions in the chat panel, and I will then put a selection of those to Cleo. Thereby, a warm welcome to Cleo, and uh, Cleo, over to you in Hootspread. Okay, so Johan has asked me to give a really broad overview of, of technology and conservation. Uh, I want to say at the start that I'm, I'm trained as an ecologist, so I know how we want to use technology, and I know how we're using it, but I don't always know how it works. So if you have technical questions, feel, feel free to ask, and I'll find the right person to answer it if I can't, which is highly likely. So um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I work at the Southern African Wildlife College, which is based uh, actually in Limpopo rather than Pumalanga, but right on the border. It's within the Greater Kruger area. This is the Kruger National Park here, and we're, we're based up, he up here in the sort of middle section. Um, these are the offices. Uh, there's no fences here, so all of the wildlife and all of the issues of conservation are very much on our doorstep. Um, we are a training organization primarily for conservation professionals. That's everyone from those just starting out as basic field rangers to very experienced conservation managers who want specific skills. As well as training, we do research and we work with other researchers to make sure that what we're training and what we're demonstrating is um, up to date and good practice. So just as an example, there's, there's Africa, the yellow star is, is the Wildlife College and the red dots are where most of our students come from. Although we do get groups from Australia, America, the Netherlands, the UK, all over the place. So we really get an opportunity to put a conservation narrative out internationally that helps inform policy and um, natural resource management into the future. We train about as well in non-COVID years in, in the old life we trained around 1,800 students a year um, and hopefully we'll be able to get back to doing that so conservation technology it's um it's changed hugely in the last 10 years 
um, largely in response to rhino poaching, um, but um, also just the development of technology as it's happened and the availability and prices have come down. So when I started doing field work in the late 90s, these were, were very much the tools of the trade. So um, maps and compasses to find your way around. If you were lucky and had a good budget, then you had a GPS. You could put your coordinates in and, and look at your sampling points. Um, notebook and, and pencil, not pen, so that when it rains, your ink doesn't run. It's very important. Um, all your other sampling tools, and then many, many, many hours transferring all of the data collected with these tools onto the computer so you could do some analysis. Um, the data that you could collect was very much limited to where you could physically get to. Um, if you wanted to know about vegetation and soil samples, you had to actually go and dig them up. If you wanted to look at wildlife um, or poaching or any of those issues, you had to get up early, use your binoculars or your scope to, to find the animals. Um, and if you were lucky and you had collars, radio collars on the animals, then you could try and find them with, with a handheld receiver listening for the beeps. So this was how I started doing conservation. Um, and this was what the, these um, radio collars was what asked for technology then. So this was the process of collecting information, whether it was for law enforcement or biological monitoring um, or, or management of resources. You took your notes, you transferred your notes to the computer. And then, like I say, if you're lucky, you could put those things onto a GPS so that other people could go and look in the same place that you'd look. So you could look at patterns over time or if you wanted other people to, to look at, say, you, um, I've got soil samples and I wanted a botanist to double check the plants there. I could send them to exactly the right spot. What's happened now with the increase in um, processing power of phones, uh, tablets, computers, and also the price coming down is that um, people have turned to this, this sort of technology more and more. And that's really speeded up what we can do in many ways. So now you can take a phone or a tablet into the field. You can collect your information. It can go through a number of different networks. So through cell phone networks, through specific satellite networks, or through something called a LoRa network, which is a um, localized network that sends small data packages over, over long distances, which can then go to a central server in the cloud or, or in a specific location, which can then be worked on immediately um, by somebody in a reserve or somebody anywhere in the world with access to that server. So this, um, and then linked to that, you can have all these other sensors that are being developed, so camera traps, additional animal collars, all of these things can now feed automatically into the server and be worked on immediately. So it really, it does a few things. It speeds up the, the way that we can collect data. It makes it more accessible to many different people and it reduces mistakes because um, like all good doctors, uh, my handwriting is appalling. So even when I had to transpose my notes from the field onto the computer, um, there were mistakes that happened. And if I had to give that information to somebody else and they had to decipher my handwriting, then, then there's mistakes. Whereas if you're in the field and you're doing it straight onto a computer via the phone, then, then it reduces those mistakes and speeds it all up. So I'm gonna talk about several of these things and how they're used, but this is, this is really how most conservation technology is set up these days. Um, so the other thing, a lot of conservation is reliant on funding. Um, and using your, your money, your financial resources as wisely as your natural resources. Um, and one of the things about this automated setup is that the reports can come out much more quickly and in a much more user-friendly format. So that can be for fairly mundane things. So at the college, we use, we use technology to monitor how much water we use, which is obviously a, a scarce and getting scarcer resource. Um, and this is a problem that we share with protected areas globally. Um, and we also monitor how much electricity we use, again, um, something that we need to be conscious of. And by, by monitoring them using technology, 
we can find problems much more quickly. So we can see here, you know, th this is a graph of how much water is used at the different buildings, and these two are much higher than the others. And because we don't have to wait for somebody to write it in a notebook, take the notebook to the office, and then somebody else in the office to transpose from the notebook onto the computer. So maybe in a month's time, you get to look at what the water usage was. Now we can check daily and say, wait a minute, this is too much. There's a leak here. We can go and address it. So there's a lot less wastage. Same for electricity, which is not very sexy, but very important and something that gets overlooked often in managing protected areas. Lodges and places like that use a huge amount of water and electricity and without monitoring. Um, the impression is that they, they, there are no disbenefits or problems with having tourism in an area, which is a complicated issue, but um, something that needs to be addressed. The other thing that you can do um, is create these nice, easy to understand reports. So for donors, for instance, um, we get a lot of money through international foundations. And for that, we obviously have to report on what we're doing and how we're doing it. And for donors, they don't want to read 48 pages of dense text um, just to try and get the, you know, the highlights from it. So using our... Um, cell phone and software technology, we can automatically now create these reports where you can pick out the highlights in a really easy, quick way. So this is for a project that we're doing on law enforcement um, in Mozambique, specifically related to COVID, because with COVID and the, and the reduction in tourism, um, there's a reduction in income to pay for anti-poaching um, and biomonitoring efforts. But there's also um, an increased need for for protein for people who were employed in tourism and now not so so there's big changes going on so we can use use our reports like this straight from the field as it happens to report to our donors how things are how things are moving on um, and then this like i say mostly in relation to the rhino poaching but now we're getting um, smart parks or connected parks where we're getting all of these kinds of resources linked up. So now you can have cameras in the field sending information in real time. And I will talk about those a little bit more in a minute. Um, you can have sensors on animal collars sending information about where they are. I'll talk about that too. You can have people collecting information on cell phones, um, for instance, at gates um, or as people patrol or as biologists are monitoring, sending it in real time. The fences themselves have a lot of detectors on them. So they can send alerts 24 hours a day, seven days a week to the people who need to know of exactly where there's a breach or where there's a problem. And they're getting more and more accurate. Previously, it was just whenever anything touched a fence. So it could have been just a, a branch from a tree brushing over it or quite often predators like to use fences to trap prey. So if impala or something ran into a fence, you'd get an alert, which is obviously not something that you want at two o'clock in the morning, but they're getting much, um, much more sensitive and, and intelligent. So now it's, it's um, fewer false alarms and more alarms when it really is a person um, uh, interacting with the fence or when there's something like an elephant breaking out of the fence, because obviously that's something else you want to know about in um, real time. There's all, so there's camera traps, which just takes images, but there's also other surveillance cameras, infrared um, and more, also all linked up. Um, in very remote areas, you can also have these um, masts that you can move, so you can set up temporary operational bases um, and have better signal um, in your networks. Um, yeah, so I'm going to address some of these things. Um, it's a lot, so I'm going to sort of whip through it. So please do stop me. Um, um, but I'm going to start more from the biological side because that's mostly my personal experience and passion. And also it's a lot less sensitive to talk about than some of the more security related issues. Um, just as a start, um, EarthRanger, who creates one of the softwares that we use to integrate data from all of these different sources. Um, and um, uh, NGO called Skylight and Wild Labs did a survey of what technologies are most used by conservationists. And you can see it's quite a broad range 
So there's global information systems. So that's uh, mostly a software. There's different camera traps. There's different tracking systems. Um, um, artificial intelligence or machine learning is something that's really coming into its own, both for um, law enforcement, but also for biological monitoring. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Obviously, like I just mentioned, this protected area systems are becoming much more integrated and powerful. Remote sensing, so using satellites to see over big distances and to record patterns over time. Um, I will give you an example of that too, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, I'll, I'll give you ex some examples, and if there's anything that you particularly want to know about that I haven't given an example of, please, please feel free to ask, and I'll try and give you an example. Um, so let's start with um, biological monitoring, monitoring of animals. Derek, I see there's things in the chat. Are you? No, okay. Nothing I need to worry about. Okay. Come back. So um, one of the projects that I was involved with before I got to the Wildlife College was monitoring lions in the central Kalahari. Um, obviously, lions are a charismatic species and an apex predator, so they're important for the functioning of the system. They're also really good to get um, funding. People like funding the sexy species. Um, and they're very important when you're looking at communities alongside protected areas because there's a lot of perception of human wildlife conflict. Um, and I will explain why I say perception rather than reality. There is some conflict, but it's much less, but I'll explain. So um, previously, one of the ways to understand lion movements across a landscape um, and their habitat use and, and their general biology was, was to in identify individual animals, which can be quite tricky to do. So this is just an example. What, what you do to identify individual lions is you look at their whisker spot patterns. So this is row A, row B, row C, and then you have additional marks here. And then you need to look for each animal. You need to get close enough with good enough binos to be able to see their unique pattern to, to know which animal it is. And then you can see how far they've moved since last you've seen them which other individuals they're associating with um, and try and make inferences about how they're using the landscape. But obviously it's, it's quite difficult. You can see this, this male's got scars, so they change over time and you really do have to know your animals and get close. So it limits how many animals you can see. And in a really big landscape like the central Kalahari, obviously a lot of them are not accessible for a lot of the time. So it's quite tricky. So, um, using that method, uh, we looked to see what we thought the lion populations in the central Kalahari were doing, and these different circles are different um, prides. So we thought there were three prides, and this was more or less how they were using their landscape. Um, and then using research done in the Serengeti and Kruger and other places, um, the social dynamics of lions are thought to be quite exclusive. One pride uses one area. Um, so that's why we had these kind of separate um, pride ranges. And you'll see like on average, it's 200 square kilometers for one um, pride for their, their kind of core home range. But after that, we managed to get these satellite collars that we could put on the lions. So um, instead of either just invite identifying individuals from their whisker spot patterns or using the handheld telemetry where you have to get close enough for the radio signal to get a beep. Um, we could use these collars which would transmit to satellites. So then we could be in camp or in Gaborone or anywhere else and see exactly where the lions were moving um, and how often and, um, and also which lions were interacting with each other. And that's all really critical information to understand their biology and therefore look at the conservation and the impact for other species and for people around them. So when we did that, we started to look at the associations of the different animals and their space use. And what we saw was in the central Kalahari, they don't adhere to the same social patterns as in Kruger and Serengeti and the other received information about lions. 
Um, and we found that their, their core home ranges were not that uh, 200 square kilometers, but 5,000 square kilometers. Um, and if you think about it, it's, it's, the explanation is quite simple. The, the, it's a very dry, poor, um, in terms of productivity system in the Kalahari. So prey is few and far between. So the, the lions need to move much further to find their prey. Um, and also to get water because there's no surface water other than a few pans. Um, and so they cannot, they just can't maintain territoriality. So um, there's quite a lot of overlap between the different prides. But we also found the social system, they weren't um, clearly defined prides either. Animals would move between the different groups. So the other thing that was important was this little blob here. So this is Kutsi Game Reserve. This is the central Kalahari. Mm -hmm. This is um, fenced, but it's a fairly, it's a pretty poor fence, to be honest. It's in sand. Um, I can dig underneath it in about 10 minutes so other animals can get under it much quicker. It's not, it's not dug in. It is electrified technically, but it's not very well maintained. So it's a very porous fence. So when we, when we looked at the lions with using the satellite collars, we could see that this one adult female, Selma, um, spent some of her time outside the, the protected area. Um, and this is where you get the human wildlife conflict because this area outside is full of cattle um, and cattle posts um, and people living with their cattle. So obviously if you've got hungry lions and cattle and people, it's not a great combination. Uh, but one of the things that we could do, because we had the collars, so what we did is um, every day you monitor where the lion is, where it's been. So we could see if a lion was in one place for more than eight hours, then we would go physically go and have a look at them. Um, because that usually me meant that they had killed something and they were, they were having a meal. So because we could do that, we could really go and see what they were eating. So you can see for most of the lions in the Kalahari, they went for Hemsbok and Eland. Um, and you can see that um, cows, donkeys and dogs were really a very small part of their diet. So this gives an indication um, of the scale of the human wildlife conflict. Uh, we did a survey of cattle owners and cattle herders. Their perception was that their losses of cattle were largely due to predation um, from leopards and lions. But when we started looking at the data, so following the lions, following the leopards, looking at the kill sites, we saw that actually less than 5% of their losses were due to predation. The rest was basically mismanagement um, and disease and, and issues related to that. So this was something that having those satellite collars and that technology allowed us to look closely at and start to sort of address perceptions versus reality um, and then try and improve things for people by educating more on... Um, livestock diseases and um, management. So this is uh, one of the lines we were looking at. This is Princess Fiona. You can see there she is looking very fat and healthy. You can't tell when a lion is, is pregnant because the cubs are so small. There's no visible sign. You can tell maybe if you can see teeth when they've just been born. But if you see a lion looking like this, it's not pregnancy. It's just really good meals. And you can see the folds here. Um, a flab basically, she's really looking fat and happy. But um, come the end of the wet season, this is the same lion. She's, she's looking very healthy, but she's lost a lot of weight. Um, and because we could keep seeing the same individuals and we could keep looking at their conditions as we, as we went through, we could start to see when the risks were higher. So what we found that this, this lion here Thelma, when she was outside, it was only at the end of the wet season, which was when the, the game inside the reserve were really in best shape. And that was when she was looking skinniest. So she would go outside and have a bit of beef because it's much easier to catch, much denser populations of cattle. Um, and But the majority of the time, 90% of the time, she was actually within the protected area. So this whole, um, I don't know if you've heard about problem animals. So they're ones that are thought to you know, cause conflict. 
it's a bit of a misnomer because she was a problem animal less than 10% of the time and in a really predictable timetable. So we could work with the communities outside to say, look, at the end of the wet season, that's when we're most, most at risk. That's when you need to make sure that your bone mass are well maintained, when you need to really herd your cattle, bring them in at night to try and reduce losses and, and reduce that conflict. So that was one of the things that we could use technology to, um, to do. The other thing, so the Botswana government, like, like many governments, um, try and address human wildlife conflict and problem animals by removing the animals. Um, and to give them credit, they don't just go and shoot them. That's a whole other discussion in itself. Sometimes I think that is actually the kind of option. Um, but what they would do would then catch the animal out, so this black dot here where, where she was causing a problem, and then relocate them back into the reserve. Um, but what we could do, because we could really track their, their movements um, over half hour periods, was to say to the government, this is not working. Um, so in this instance, there was an adult female and two sub-adult cubs that were caught outside the reserve. They had killed some cattle. Um, the catching of them was quite a traumatic experience for them. And unfortunately, one of the sub-adult cubs died because of the stress of the capture and also the, the capture drugs that we used to sedate them. So that's really not ideal. Um, the, the land was then driven back into the reserve. These are the roads um, to about 60, 70 kilometers away from where she was caught. So she woke up a few hours later with her one sub-adult cub. She then spent a couple of days looking, I think, I don't know, anthropomorphizing a little bit, but looking for her other cub. And when she didn't find him, she walked. So in just over 24 hours, she walked in a straight line back to within 500 meters of where she was caught. So she clearly knows the area really well. So the money, the time, the risk to people and to the animals themselves in this kind of a relocation program is really wasted effort. Um, and this was something that we were able to show the Botswana government to, to look at their policies to see how to deal with problem animals. This was another, another incident. Um, again, um, animal caught on the outside, driven all the way in, these close dots are actually the animal in the truck being driven in and then walking more or less straight back. So they know the area well enough that that relocating them like that is not an option. But understanding when is your risk time, where is your risk time, and what you can do to minimize those risks is a much better way to use those resources and less stressful for everybody. So um, that example was lions, but it's a similar story with elephants. Um, these are pictures of some elephant damage, destroying crops, destroying water tanks, destroying um, homes, big trees. There's a lot in the media in the elephant management debate, vehicles, breaking fences. You know, it is a problem having elephants in an area. And obviously, with the same satellite collars, this comes from an NGO called Elephants Alive, you can look and see where are the elephants moving what seasons are they likely to come out? Where are they going to? And alert communities ahead of time and maybe um, put specially trained um, protection officers in the place and start to use deterrent methods like chilies and bear bangers and other things to try and encourage elephants away from um, causing damage to people and communities. Um, so another thing about so that, that's collars. This is now um, slightly different technology, but also biological monitoring um, using cameras and artificial intelligence or machine learning. So this was a study that we did. Um, a lot of private reserves particularly um, rely on hunting as a source of income for, for their protected areas. Um, whatever, my, whatever your personal views on hunting, for me as a conservationist, it does if it's well managed and within strict parameters, I think it does have a place to, to work with conservation. Um, essentially, as soon as you fence an area, you have to manage that population. Um, and managing the population often means culling, killing animals. 
Um, and if somebody will pay you to do that, then you kill two birds with one stone and you get much needed revenue so that you can protect all the species in an area. Um, so trophy buffalo are one of the ways that um, reserves can, can fund all of their conservation work. Um, a trophy bull is a bull that has um, horns from outside edge to outside edge of more than 40 inches. And over the years, there's been a decline in the number of trophy bulls available for hunting and therefore um, revenue possible. Um, the, the obvious answer for that is that they've been shot because if you keep shooting all the bulls with the big horns, then you're not going to have any bulls with big horns. Horns is 50% hereditary and 50% environmental. So if you keep taking out those genes, then you're not going to get um, large horned bulls. But what we wanted to do was assess the population because the hunting fraternity said uh, that this has happened, but the, the permitting agency said, no, it hasn't. So there was some disagreement as to what the reality was. So what we could do um, was use aerial photography. So a plane could go over and photograph large herds of animals. Um, in one day, you could, you could photograph a couple of thousand animals, which would take you a couple of months if you were doing it on the ground, and then teach the computer to recognize what is a buffalo. So that's this bigger square here. If this is the computer recognizing that this is a buffalo. And then <clears throat> teach it to look at the, the head of the animal. So it could see, like, it could see that this calf is a buffalo, but it starts looking at the head, there's no horns, so it ages it as a calf. Um, and then starts to look at the size of the horn. So you can see that square around it is the computer looking at the horns of this animal. And then what, what we taught it to do was to look at where the ears stop because the ears are more or less standard length and then assess what um, comes past the ears to look at the size of the horns. Um, and then in males, we also, there's no bulls in my example picture, but males have a big dewlap and they, oh, there, here's a male. Um, they have a big dewlap and they have big shoulders. So we also taught it to look at that. So by the end of our training period, the computer was 99% accurate on counting the animals, 96% accurate on, um, on aging them, so into calf, sub-adult, on adult, and 89% accurate on telling us whether it was a bull and putting it into a trophy class. So that meant using that um, machine learning, we could assess many, many, many more buffalo than we could if you actually have to sit at a computer and start to zoom in and zoom out and try and measure by eye these different um, horn uh, trophy sizes and horns. You can see, actually, here's a male. So you can see the ears um, end, and there's still a lot of horn as opposed to the female where the ears end and there's not much protruding horn. <coughs> um, so by doing this, we could see that there was actually um, fewer males with big horns in the areas with high hunting pressure than in the areas with no hunting pressure. So we were able to inform hunting policy to say you have to leave these, these big males in the population and let them breed um, before you hunt them. So um, previously trophies were wanted to be sort of unscarred young males and now you're not allowed to kill those animals. Um, so that improves things for the population, it improves things for conservation, and it improves things financially for the reserves because they actually have um, males that they, can, that they can sell. As I say, it's a bit controversial depending on your view of hunting, but this is one way that we've used technology to try and improve things. Uh, so that was a really quick uh, whiz through biology. Um, and our quick look at security. So using the same kind of technology as in those lion collars, you can put tags um, in or on rhino. Rhino don't really have a neck, so you can't collar them in the same way that you can lions or buffalo. Um, so you can either put um, transponders in a horn, um, and then you fill it up with um, dental enamel, um, or you can put a cuff around their leg, um, or we're trying now to put these very small tags on their ears. 
Um, they all have downsides. The horn grows out like toenails, so it lasts about 18 months if you put it in the horn and then you've got to do it again. Uh, rhinos are not very light on their feet, so if you put a cuff around their leg, they tend to bash it off quite quickly. Um, the tags and the ears have had mixed results so far because they sometimes they tear their ears when they're rushing through thorny um, bushes, but we have um, been working on that and we've got a much better success. But anyway, so from the tags, um, the signal can go to the satellites or to local network towers, or you can still use your transceivers by UHF or, or the ordinary radio transceivers. That information then goes into, into a server, into the cloud, where it can be assessed in, in more or less real time on computers or on cell phones um, or uh, remote places. So now you can use that same technology with everything within your park. So this is a different picture, a similar setup to the one I showed you before. But so from a central control center, you can see where your rhinos are and how they're behaving. And because we've been able to track them, we can now understand their biology and know when they get stressed um, and when they're being chased or when they're looking, when their behavior patterns are different from what we would expect. And because they're mega herbivores, um, they're very predictable animals. So that's quite handy if you're looking for um, abnormal behavior. You can also fly over and have sensors in your plane and have machine learning assessing your pictures. You can assess where your ranges are and give instructions to and from. Um, you can have drones in some areas, not legal over South African national parks at the moment, but that might change. Um, and then you can have all of these other sensors spread around the field. So camera traps is something I've mentioned. You can also have sound detection systems, so listening out for dogs or people. Um, there's these pressure pads that are put under the ground. So if anybody crosses over them, it sends an alert. And some of them are now um, so sensitive that they pick up any metal that goes over them. So even just a rivet in a pair of jeans um, or a screw on a on a weapon. So a Glock is a is a plastic weapon, but they do sometimes have metal screws um, or in the ammunition, and that will pick that up and give you an alert that somebody's gone in. Um, and then infrared cameras and um, um, sensors around the place, so looking for heat signals and everything, um, uh, and other kind of indicators of people where you don't expect them to be. Um, so then with all these sensors, but particularly with camera traps, again, using machine learning, you get these pictures sent, um, and, but there's a lot of pictures generated because most of them are motion triggered. Um, and that could be grass waving in front of the camera. It could be a bird taking off. Um, and obviously you don't want alerts every time a picture is taken. Um, just to give an example, we did a camera trap study in, in the central Kalahari. We had 12 cameras out um, and over a period of, of 12 months a year, we had over 4 million pictures that we then had to sort through and just say grass, 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 oh, lion. Um, but now the um, machine learning can do that for you. So you can set with various different products, you can set which things you want alerts for. So maybe you want to know if a rhino walks past the camera. Maybe you want to know if it's a vehicle and you definitely want to know if it's a person. So the way that it does it is very much like the Buffalo data set. You teach the computer to know what it's looking for. So it can look for priority species. This is an example from Asia. This is an Asian elephant. Um, or it can just look for the shape. So most animals are kind of rectangular shape as opposed to people which are also rectangular, but vertical as opposed to horizontal. Um, and so can give just alert you when you get pictures that you're interested in. So that really makes uh, a ranger's life so much easier. Um, they get more sleep because they're not constantly being alerted by sensors or cameras or other technology that um, is just telling them about ordinary biological activity as opposed to something you might want to be concerned about. The other thing then about all of these sensors and all of this technology deployed is, is how do you look at it? How do you actually make sense of all of this information that's coming in? Because you spend a lot of money um, putting these things out. Um, 
an example, one of those smart fences is about 90 million US dollars um, for a small area of Cuba. So it's a huge amount of money. It's a massive investment. You need to be able to use that information wisely. And how do you do that? When these things, you know, you've got your cameras coming in, you've got your rangers coming in, you've got your um, seismic sensors, everything's bombarding you. How, how do you make sense of it? So um, there has been a lot of development in, in, in software that combines this machine learning um, and integration. So you get real-time maps. So down on the left-hand side, this is a product called Seymour that was developed by the CSIR from the military, but now being used very much for law enforcement and conservation, also for biological monitoring, but that was an artisan. Um, so down here on the left-hand side, you have all of your alerts. So it can be people sending a message that they've seen tracks, or it can be your camera, or it can be your whatever sensor. And then... Um, those alerts can be responded to and can be resolved. So, yep, I'm happy with that. I know I sent guys there, don't need to worry about that one. Or, yes, this one is an issue. We need to send people to go and have a look or send a drone over to go and have a look or move our cameras to look. And then it puts it all on a map. Um, so you can see in real time where your different resources are, where your vehicles are, where your people are, where your rhinos are, and, and start to kind of maneuver things around the landscape as it suits you. But you can imagine then this creates a huge amount of data to try and untangle. So one of the massive increases with technology now is um, the computing power, the ability to process these enormous databases. And they, they really are ridiculously huge um, and not something that you could kind of manually um, try and manipulate. Um, and just an example of how that's being used for security and protection is um, Seymour, that product I just showed you, collects all of this information from the field, which then goes into another tool called iBase, which is a database mining tool. Um, and then all of that information is shared amongst different security agencies, both conservation agencies, but then others, the police, the Hawks, state security um, and so that information can be used more effectively and efficiently, and you can start to do things proactively. So you can try and um, stop things happening before animals or people are shot. Um, also, you can start to identify um, different relationships. And one of the things that they found um, is that the, the people organizing the rhino poaching are the same people doing the cash in transit and the same people doing the farm robberies. Um, and this is something that because you have all of this analysis um, capabilities now, you can start looking at cell phone records um, and locations, license plate recognition inside and outside protected areas, um, known associates, so if people are arrested together, um, who else have they associated with? And then you can start to identify individuals of concern and keep a closer eye, closer eye on them. This is just an example of a simplified kind of network that allows you to trace people. And this has all come about um, through in improvements in technology. Um, so the last part of the story, I hope you guys are all still awake and with me. Um, is using remote sensing, so using satellite data. Um, and yeah, and there's some warnings with this one. Not that there aren't warnings with others, but um, so like I said previously, if you wanted to take samples, you have to physically go there and get the samples, look or, or remove or whatever. Whereas now you can use satellite. So Within an hour, with satellites and machine learning, you can sample this entire area for different things. So reflectivity and measures of greenness can tell you how much grass is in an area or how much bare ground or what kind of vegetation. Is it um, grassland? Is it woodland? Is it thicket? Is it being eroded? And then you, because you can sample so quickly, you can sample over time and see how things are changing, which obviously with... Um, climate change and increased populations and increased pressure is something that we're very interested in knowing. But, and there is a very large but, 
Um, although remote sensing is really, really useful, it doesn't always get it right. So there does need to be interpretation. Um, and I think something this is something that's missed often in the media and something I'll come to in a minute. Um, but just to give an example on, on a small study that we did, this is the same area that was covered by the satellite. So we subsampled for each black dot we went to and we looked at a 50 by 50 meter grid and then we did our own visual assessment. Um, and then from this, the satellite estimates were that you could have 0.2 head of livestock per hectare based on what it thought the vegetation in the area was looking like. Whereas when we did the on the ground assessments, we actually found that you could have far more animals per hectare. Um, and this, the grazing capacity obviously is a function of how much trees or bare ground or grass cover you have. So you can see the blue is our measures on the ground and the orange is the estimates from the satellite. So it doesn't quite work out right. So it's, it gives you a really good indication over a large scale and over time, but you do need to be careful that you interpret it correctly and that you do do some ground truthing to have a look. Um, another example of this, this is a paper looking at um, the temperature differences in urban landscapes um, because that impacts the biology of the area and also um, it heats up the atmosphere. So for climate change, this is something that's increasingly being looked at. Um, these bottom pictures are individual weather stations. So people who have a weather station in their garden or wherever it might be. And the, these pictures are a satellite um, image of temperature. And you can see that the satellite, um, the redder it is, the hotter it is, and the satellite massively overestimated the heat signatures from the various cities across Europe. Um, so again, if you're looking to, if you're trying to look at the impact of things and, and then um, how you might address that impact, you do need to be a bit careful with the satellite data. Um, one other example, which is uh, close to my heart at the moment, a lot of people are trying to do the right thing by planting trees. Um, and you see these kind of maps where, um, People say that the Northern Hemisphere scientists have done some modeling and then they've looked at satellite images and then they've said that large parts of the world should be forest, should be planted with trees. And this is how we're going to address climate change by absorbing carbon into trees. Um, but according to these maps, savanna landscapes, which are natural and important functioning grassland landscapes like the Have I Felt areas, um, Fainboss, the whole of the whole of the Cape Town area, should be reforested according according to the Northern Hemisphere scientists on um, using this satellite predictive network. We need to be planting trees across all of these different biomes, which would do a huge amount of damage um, to just all of the ecosystem functioning and the diversity and all of the unique species. Fainboss is one of the most biodiverse biomes in the world. So if we planted it with trees, it would be destroyed. Um, the other thing I just wanted to throw in is that this whole tree planting thing is a misnomer anyway, because you get between six and 22 kilograms of carbon per tree per year if you plant fast growing um, trees like um, wattles, pines, blue gums, which are all invasive in South Africa. Um, if you were to plant those invasive trees, you would need to plant an area the size of Saudi Arabia, so double the size of South Africa, every year for the next 40 years to be able to make any kind of difference to um, the carbon in the atmosphere. And then once they've stopped growing in 40 years, then what? You can't burn them because then you release all the carbon again. Um, if you just let them rot, it releases a large amount of carbon again. Um, if you process them for paper or anything else, you release all that carbon. So what do you do? Um, never mind the fact that it would destroy our water and um, just all of the, the biodiversity in the area. So just as a, a little bit off topic, but please be careful when you're looking at some of these big data stories, it needs careful interpretation. Um, and so, yep, the other thing that you can look at is patterns over time. So you could see in these pictures, um, images of uh, 1955 and 2011 in exactly the same place, 
near, near King Williamstown. And you can see there's an awful lot more um, trees and bushes now than there was. This is, this is a phenomenon called bush encroachment, and it's something that's happening globally, <laughs> despite people saying that we don't have enough forests and we need to reforest. Um, this is also in Zululand, 1937 and 2010. You can see in 1937 it was very open. In 2010, it's looking much more closed woodland and thicket. Um, and using technology, we, so there's been a huge amount of theories as to why this is happening and what the mechanism is. But using technology, we can now really monitor and create um, conditions to have a look. So this thing here that looks very boring is a, quite an exciting thing called a flux tower. And it measures um, gas and water um, emissions from soil landscapes. So you can look at what, how much carbon is being released or absorbed in the area or water or other gases. Um, and then by using that, we can recreate. So what we found is that, um, not me, I must say, friends of mine, um, grew trees, some of these trees, uh, acacia, nilotica, and karoo, that are the ones that are encroaching in these areas. And what they found is in really low um, carbon dioxide, atmospheric carbon dioxide, like pre-industrial revolution, this was the rootstock of those trees. So if you had a fire or a herbivore, the tree didn't recover. So the area was kept open. Then you get industrial revolution, um, and then you get increasing levels of carbon dioxide. So this is now, and this is what it's predicted to be in the not too distant future. And you can see that the rootstocks of those trees become um, a lot stronger. So then if they're knocked back by fire, they can recover quickly, or by herbivory, they can recover quickly. And so uh, they start to take over the landscape. Um, similarly, you can look at how plants use water and how the different grasses and trees and types of trees use water. And by measuring with the flux towers, you can see what's available and therefore predict what sort of plants are going to do well, um, which obviously is really important now with climate change um, in areas that are predicted to get drier or get wetter. We can we can predict how the different plants are going to respond and what the landscape will start to look like. Um, and this is only possible because we have this kind of technology now. Before there was just a huge amount of fighting about what might be happening. There's still the fighting, but there's more data now to back up the arguments. Ooh, that was a quick run through, but I think I've taken a lot of time. So let me just quickly, in summary, there's a lot of applications of conservation technology, and I've just tried to show you a few of them. Um, it allows you to see over time, space, record information, but you do have to be really careful with the interpretation of that data. <sighs> I'll stop talking. Sorry, there was a lot to say. Great, thanks a lot, Cleo. Dai asks, how do you attach the collar to the lines? And maybe um, how long do these power or battery solutions for these devices last? Um, you dart them with drugs, put them to sleep, uh, and then you approach them very cautiously and you, you um, bolt the collars on. Uh, and the batteries, it depends how often you ask them to send a signal, but you do try for animal welfare reasons not to redart them too often. So about 18 months to two years-ish before you need to change the batteries, depending on how data intensive your, your collection is. Good. Then Penny wants to know how are chilies used as deterrents for elephants? You mentioned that. Oh, they really don't like chili. They're, they're quite sensitive to chili. So you can put up things called chili fences um, where you string hot chilies, chili powder, bombs, um, smear fences with, with hot chili. Um, and then when they sniff it, they don't like it. They're really sensitive to it. You have to keep moving it. You can't put it all in, in the same place all the time because they find ways around it. But um, yeah, you, chili chili's quite a good deterrent. And bees. Bees is the other thing that's quite a good deterrent as long as you keep moving them. Uh, Jeff was just checking your financial side here. He says, did you say 90 million for a smart fence? Yeah, I did. It's ridiculously expensive. So you need to make sure that you use it well. If you're going to spend that kind of money on it, it really does need to be used well. Angela asked, has technology been used to track or manage the interbreeding of domestic or feral cats within the African wildcat? I don't know. I imagine there is some collar data probably out there. Um, I don't know the answer to that one. 
Sorry, Angelo. Bernard says, does poaching or hunting select for hornless rhinos or tuskless elephants? And can this be followed in the animal's DNA? You're welcome to unmute yourself if you want to elaborate a little on that question. There was a report in, um, I think a BBC report that said that in Mozambique, that they're seeing more and more horn, uh, tuskless elephants now, and they put it down to, to poaching. And I wondered if it's been more widespread observation of this. Um, yeah, that has been seen in Kenya as well. There's been a reduction in the average size of tusks, uh, also put down to poaching. It is something that's being monitored over time. Um, it hasn't been seen in rhino yet, but the, the rhino poaching really only started about 10 or 11 years ago. So um, there hasn't, as far as I know, and that is something that is monitored, there hasn't been a reduction in horn size in rhino, but their lifespan is 60 or so years. So um, you wouldn't expect to see it over such a short time period, whereas the, the response um, from elephants to hunting that, I mean, they've been hunted for ivory for several hundred years. So um, that's where you see the elephant response. Thank you. Good, thanks Bernard. Uh, Mike wants to know if elephants are getting too numerous. We did use technology though. We did look at where the elephants are and where rhino are, because obviously management of rhino is a hot topic and management of elephants is a hot topic. Um, and we looked at the interaction between the two and we found that when elephants move into an area, rhinos move out. So where you think you might be protecting a rhino hotspot, if the elephants are there, the rhinos have gone somewhere else. So it's um, another way to use the monitoring data to, to help with the protection of specific species. Yes, Benny, sorry, I missed you there. Okay. We recently had a talk on uh, satellite info being used in farming. And I'm very interested to say to hear that you say uh, the the data can be misleading, and I wonder whether that um, data that they they get from the farming instruments uh, implements rather and satellites is also misleading. Um, I think it depends. I don't have much experience with that personally, but I would imagine that it depends which kind of farming you're looking at and how you're using the data. So if you may be looking at crops where you've got a bit more of predictability in terms of what you expect to see versus what you actually see, then I imagine you'd have less problem um, with those discrepancies. But if you're looking at it for estimating where your livestock should be, then, then there are still quite a few issues um, like we found. But you can, if you do the same areas over time, you can look at what the satellite says, look at what you say, and then make a model the adjustment so that you get uh, a more realistic picture if you repeat they, over time. They were looking at things like uh, moisture content in the soil and also uh, nutrition in the soil. I mean, did it need more nitrates here or more something else there, you know, which is quite, quite, an, quite an interesting uh, thing to think about right now. Yeah, definitely. So I think the nutrition often is um, from the NDVI, so it looks at a greenness index, so that you would need, you would need to make an adjustment from what you see on the ground and what you see from satellites. Thank you. Good, good. Thanks a lot, uh, Cleo. Thanks for having me. Um, tech obviously has some limitations, but it's nice to hear about all the new tools that the conservation has saved in their tool belt. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I found it fascinating to listen to. Thanks. Very... I'm sorry, it took me a lot longer than I. Thought. No, it's <laughs> fine. It's fine. We, we, we specifically limit this to one presentation. If they overrun a little, it's not that much of an issue. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I found it fascinating to listen to the very practical examples of cutting edge technology being applied in a very challenging environment. Um, maybe just a small example closer to home. Because of load shedding, I'm attending this from my son's house. And uh, I've noticed that these two cats are roaming around, each having an Apple Air tag around their neck. So I guess this is an example of consumer adoption. So I think conservation is generally quite behind the times on technology. I think that's to do with a lot of people People who want, like me, who want to work in conservation, like being in the bush. We don't really want to be behind a computer. Um, and so there's quite a lot of kind of fear and mistrust of using technology. Um, so private sector has developed a lot. And then some of us are like, oh, actually, we, we could use that. Can we have that too, please? Um, but that is one of the problems with conservation technology is getting buy-in, particularly from the very practical field ranges on the ground. Yes. Yeah. 
Good, thank you very much. So, um, Neil, we have a couple of house matters to attend to. You are welcome to stick around. Um, thank you. I'm eight well, minutes late for my next meeting. So I'm gonna... You stepped out of another meeting to uh, address us. So uh, thank you. We really appreciate that.